and hello to everybody. My name is Victoria Keane and I'm from Homes England's Local Government Capacity Centre and I'm delighted to welcome you to our summer learning programme. This programme offers a knowledge sharing session or a number of knowledge sharing sessions on topics that you've told us are of interest to you. And today's event is on the subject place-based approaches to delivery. The session today is brought to you by the Local Government Capacity Centre and um, we've been running the summer learning programme for the last two weeks. This slide summarises who we are and what we do. We've launched the centre following extensive research and consultation with you from across local government and with a whole range of other partners to determine where authorities most need support and how this can be best delivered. And we'll look forward to hearing how we did in the survey at the end and also the three polls that we're going to run at the end. Next slide, please. Hi, so here's the agenda for today. So first of all, we're going to hear from Danielle Gillespie, Homes England's Director of Cities and Major Conurbations. Then we'll hear from Andrew McIntosh, Director of Place at the Greater Manchester Combined Authority. We'll then hear from Caroline Simpson, Chief Executive of Stockport Council. And then finally, Tom Stannard, Chief Executive of Salford City Council. Then we'll have a Q&A session, which will be run by Danielle Gillespie and some final thoughts from D Danielle wrapping up the session. And before you go, I'm going to then launch a few polls to get some feedback from you. So without further ado, I'm delighted to hand you over to Danielle Gillespie. Thank you. Thanks very much, Victoria. And welcome everyone to today's uh, 16th summer learning session on place-based working. And thank you for taking times out of your busy diaries to join us. Um, I work at Homes England covering our major conurbations and cities in Homes England. So that means I lead on our place-based partnerships and our major projects, which tend to have more of a, a regeneration flavour to them. And I'm thrilled today to be joined on the panel by Caroline, Tom and Andrew, who not only uh, share a passion for this topic, but are people that I get to work closely with day to day. Uh, for those of you who already work in local government or perhaps like me have just been involved in the housing and regeneration sector for a good while, the concept of place-based approaches to delivery is not a new one. I think it's something many of us are familiar with. However, I think it's fair to say that in the past couple of years, some of the prerequisites that have been uh, needed to adopt that approach uh, have been uh, challenging to, to come by. And that could be simply because of the challenging external landscape we've faced into, financial crash, periods of austerity, uh, the need to be responsive in a COVID environment. But it also picks up on some of the other more fundamental challenges, which the white paper itself has acknowledged that we have moved towards quite a centralised policy response environment. And there is a need now more than ever as we move to level up the country, as we move to uh, bolster a period of local empowerment to really adopt a more place-based uh, approach to joint working. Uh, today, you'll hear from our three panel uh, members on their experience of working in that way historically now and where they're seeking to take their organisations in the future. And hopefully uh, they'll share with you their wisdom their top tips and be candid with you in relation to some of the real barriers that we are facing at the moment and how we can overcome them. We'll kick off with presentations and we'll run the three concurrently before we move into the Q&A session. But as Vic said earlier, uh, if you could help us and participate by capturing your thoughts and comments in the question bar as we go, uh, whether that be surgery style, seeking advice or questions and clarifications, the more the merrier and we'll seek to bring them into the Q&A panel discussion at the end. Uh, but we've come here to learn. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Andrew. And uh, uh, Andrew, over to you. Hi, thanks, Danielle. So hi, uh, my name is Andrew McIntosh. I'm the Director of Place for Greater Manchester Combined Authority. So I'm going to talk to you about the role of the GMC. In the next slide, please. So the GMC is made up of 10 Greater Manchester uh, local authorities and the mayor. So we work collaboratively with the local authorities, businesses, communities and other partners to improve the city region. 
So it was originally set up as the Association Against the Manchester Authorities in 1986. And we've established a number of subsidiary agencies to support the strategic work that we undertake. The GMCA was actually officially formed in 2011 alongside the establishment of Transport for Greater Manchester and the Mayor was first elected in 2017. Uh, we've developed and refreshed the Greater Manchester strategy over the years, supported by an evidence-based economic analysis. The GMCA uh, benefit from having the same ge geographic footprint as the 10 local authorities, Transport for Greater Manchester, the Local Enterprise Partnership, and the Health and Social Care Partnership. Uh, I'm sure I've missed a few, but this is exceptionally helpful in terms of uh, governance and determining the strategy uh, that, that we take across GM, uh, but not all combined authorities are in the same, in the same position. Uh, next slide, please. So, what is the role of the CA? Uh, CA is actually run by the 10 local authority leaders and, and the mayor. There's currently 2.9 million people reside in Greater Manchester. And the United approach to the GMCA provides a more powerful regional voice when in discussions with central government with the GM taking forward strategic projects and issues that might impact all 10 local authorities. We similarly develop strategies that equally apply to the wider population uh, with the Greater Manchester strategy being pivotal to that. So we work on cross-cutting issues and themes such as transport, regeneration, health and attracting investment to name just a few. Uh, the approach adopted is however centred centered upon supporting the agreed local priorities and working in collaboration. Uh, next slide please. But what does it actually mean to work with this? In relation to these themes, we act on behalf of the local authorities. The single voice provides a clear narrative to government about our ambitions, enabling devolution agreements to be entered into and the region to have better access to national funding. This is all underpinned by a series of joint strategies. The Greater Manchester strategy sitting at the top with lots of supporting strategies underneath. Now, the uh, 11 leaders has a portfolio over which they have responsibility. So for example, Andrew Weston, the leader of Trafford Council has responsibility for place-based regeneration and housing and will lead in all the related work in this area on behalf of the combined authority. So this creates efficiencies in the way that we work together uh, as all uh, leaders don't need to be involved in all the discussions. Uh, there is also a chief executive for each of the portfolios to give an officer lead as well as the political lead. Ultimately, however, all the 10 local authorities and the CA take decisions and agree the approach collectively. By focusing on issues that, all, that affect all 10, it enables the wider impacts to be considered and long-term strategies to be developed, such as a 2040 transport, uh, transport strategy. This is a coherent regional transport plan and vision for the conurbation that connects the people of our towns to the opportunities across the conurbation. Uh, next slide, please. So I suppose what is a a place-based approach. So I believe that the approach that we adopt regionally is a place-based approach and that we use this approach to deliver better outcomes. I know that terminology hasn't uh, been defined nationally and means different things to different people, but I do believe now that the government's narrative is starting to align with where we've been heading for some time. But what does that actually mean in practice? So it means that we work collaboratively with themes and take account of wider benefits for the conurbation, as well as recognising the inter interdependencies uh, that exist between the authorities. It is this way of working that delivers efficiencies. So trying to put this into some context, uh, the GMCA was awarded 100 million under the Brownfield Housing Fund announced in 2020. So it's ultimately administered by the Department for Levelling Up and Housing, uh, with allocations given directly to combined authority areas. Effectively, this meant that GMCA had control over the money and could allocate it within some broad programme parameters set by GLOT. Due to relationships and working groups that exist in the CA, uh, we managed to agree across all 10 local authorities the more detailed rules that we should be using to prioritise which projects should be funded, manage the relatively straightforward bidding process and got agreement to those projects that should be funded by the combined authority. Now, this was done over a matter of months in partnership with the local authorities. And without those relationships in place, it would have been extremely difficult to get such a speedy agreement to the GM approach. And now I actually see buildings coming out of the ground that we've enabled through the collaboration, which satisfies me enormously and makes the job uh, worth.
but why does it make sense? So we try and recognise the boundaries within which the social activity helps local outcomes and areas where things uh, must be delivered locally to maximise the benefits. Again, this is all done through collaboration. It makes sense that we work to our strengths across the across the regions. Uh, clearly, we don't always get it right. We're only human, but working collaboratively means we can build relationships that over time are far more beneficial. And as with many things in life, having personal relationships with those that you deal with make the difficult discussions easier to navigate and to find compromises that meet everyone's needs. The issues that society faces today do not necessarily respect local authority boundary lines drawn on a map, where in practice our residents probably don't even notice that they've walked from one local authority into another just because they've crossed the road. So putting in a place appropriate governance in the way that we have enables this collaboration and the approach enables the multitude of relationships to be managed. This, I mean, there's a clear route to decision making, clear time scales that everyone knows we are working to and therefore confidence undertake them what necessary. I believe it's, it's actually confidence which is crit uh, critical, especially when we can give that confidence to our private sector partners who will ultimately invest far more in regeneration the public sector will. The next slide please. Uh, but how does a place-based approach support local authorities? So there's alignment of priorities and we all work uh, to the, to the joint objectives. There are areas where we share best practice with close working relationships making this easier. Because it's always easier to replicate the success of a project when you physically can actually put that person into the new project that's actually delivered the project previously. And so that, that sharing of best practice becomes easier. Uh, the region itself operates as a functioning economic area, which means that all 10 local authorities understand the benefits that are created for themselves and the region through investment in other local authorities. And it's not just about a local authority getting its fair share of any funding. So the approach enables investment in GM to be channeled into those areas that provide wider benefits to the conurbation of those areas in the greatest need. Working together enables GM to have different delivery approaches to different programmes that also create efficiencies. We don't duplicate the same structures across 10 local authorities and we can avoid it and uh, that helps take some of the management further out, further out at a GM level. We even create specialist teams to support local authorities with deliver programmes on behalf of the 10 where this makes sense. So an example of the type of project being the £3 billion Metrolink extension programme which is enhanced connectivity uh, across the conurbation and enabled more residents to access growing education, training and employment opportunities across the city region. So the project was actually managed centrally for transport for Greater Manchester and the Metrolink itself has only been extended in a few areas where the biggest benefits uh, were, were assessed to be delivered. Uh, but agreement to that approach was provided across all the 10 due to the strategic rationale for the approach. And a good example of a central team is GM's co-investment team that manages I think more than 600 million of investment funds that we've created over the last 10 plus years at a GM level. Now these can all be accessed by all 10 local authorities. The team has commercial investment expertise and the local authorities also draw on this experience when delivering their own projects, even if they're not being funded through the GMC. This ultimately avoids some consultancy costs, which is critical in these times of financial pressure. Hopefully my colleagues that we're presenting next believe that activity at the regional level supports the local ambitions as it creates that framework within which we can operate and provides a platform for investment at sub-regional level and ultimately supports our place-based development approach. Next slide please. So we're in the process of taking a spatial plan through the examination in public such that it can be adopted and create the framework for development over the next 15 years across Greater Manchester. Uh, this has been a long process uh, for those that have spent the last couple of years possibly tracking its process publicly and involved identifying existing land and new allocations which we would bring forward the necessary development in that period. However, however, the journey we've been on has been fundamentally important in paving the way for, for the future and creates a blueprint for activity going forward. It creates a platform for engaging with partners, provides clarity and certainty over where we're actually heading. Now this allows partners, both public and private, to shape their own development plans and accept, uh, accelerate delivery. We've highlighted within that plan six broad growth locations across the conurbation, which 
uh, on which we can focus uh, to drive more opportunities. This will drive both economic growth and create the opportunity for residents to access employment opportunities with all the necessary skills and business support. Uh, it enables us to develop a long term strategies that create the right ecosystem to deliver inclusive growth and start to address the inequalities we see across Greater Manchester. With government and GM's net zero ambitions, taking a long term approach will enable us to consider how we meet the challenge ahead in terms of reducing carbon emissions. And while we still need government support to deliver a lot of these ambitions, we are building upon a plan with private and public partners that supports those investment decisions and justifies the necessary investment in green growth. To put a bit of colour around that, we have strong working relationships with uh, Electricity North West, Caden, the Environment Agency, and actually they work with us on uh, particularly the spatial framework to actually shape their own investment plans in, in the region, which actually ensures that as we bring forward developments that they are investing in the same places and also allows us to collaborate to try and actually innovate in what infrastructure is going in, all of which is part of contributing to uh, delivering against our green growth ambitions. Uh, next slide, please. Homes England uh, are actually one of our key partners for bringing forward housing and place-based regeneration ambitions. Uh, while we've always engaged with Homes England, I think we needed to recognise the importance of the relationship and we therefore formally established the strategic place partnership with Homes England to focus on how we increase and accelerate the outputs that can be delivered by the partners within GM. That the purpose of the partnership is to create a joint approach to increase quality, pace and scale of housing delivery and place making in Greater Manchester. We recognise that we should be able to achieve more by working collaboratively across the organisation and with the local authorities. And while it's just been announced at the CIH, I think two weeks ago, we have actually been working on this for more than 18 months. Uh, and the working arrangements are already in place and the Strategic Place Partnership Board is already in place with the tendency from senior leadership from both organisations. This includes the leader of Trafford Council as a relevant portfolio lead from the Greater Manchester perspective, signifying the importance that we place in such strategic relationships. Now, we've identified priority areas where plans are most progressed to drive forward delivery of outputs and are using a joint approach with the local authorities and delivery partners to achieve these better outcomes. We are focusing on developing the pipeline to ensure that we can respond to the funding opportunities that present themselves. We're constantly needing to have shovel ready projects that can spend capital funding in the short term. This pipeline development is therefore critical. Aligning resources and tools will help us create efficiencies across the organisations through the development process. Uh, we'll also uh, look to tie in the, the ongoing activity that we have with other partners and not just public partners, but private partners are some of the key developers that have got uh, land holdings across GM that equally want to support delivery uh, at a GM level. So it is a part of a system-wide approach that will ultimately see all parties uh, hopefully working together to achieve joint objectives. So the agreement itself opened up the door to some revenue support, uh, and we are, we are aligning this with our own internal resources to develop projects for our growth locations and the development of local investment framework documents, which are our approach to business cases for three key priority areas within uh, GM. So hopefully, given you a good overview of the roles of the combined authority and how we work with the local authorities and homes England to meet our joint objectives, clearly a lot of activity that I've not touched on. Uh, now, very much hoping that the GM College will both endorse the benefits of the approach that we take within GM and put some more colour around the local activity that's undertaken. I do personally always feel that I've got an easier task working at the combined authority with the local authorities doing all the really hard work. Uh, and on that note, I will hand over to Caroline Simpson. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. So, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Caroline Simpson. I'm Chief Executive of Stockport Council. And what I will hopefully do in the next 10 minutes is um, put everything Andrew said in that place-based context in, in Stockport. So if we just move on, um, Amber, through the slides, uh, just in case uh, you don't know where Stockport is. I realise it's the centre of my universe. It might not be the centre of everybody's here uh, in the virtual room today. But here we are, part of Greater Manchester, but also on the edge of the Peak District and um, proximity to transport networks, uh, particularly Manchester Airport, 
absolutely fundamental so the kind of you know thinking about the place not only uh kind of looking uh into your place but how you are connected how you are positioned uh massively important as you will be aware and all the little dots on that screen show that Stockport is a town borough we're focused around our major town centre but we are a collection of neighbourhoods and everywhere will be the same um but it's really important I think uh you know that that places is, is distinctive to uh, that particular neighbourhood. But we're going to be focusing on the big per, uh, pink blob uh, around the town centre for the purpose of uh, bringing to life some of the regen we've been involved in. So um, just moving on to the next slide, please. A um, little bit about who, who we are. So we've got a population of about 290,000 um, and our economy is pretty buoyant. Uh, we've got strong uh, GVA, we've got good business space, very well networked, uh, very active business space, um, relatively good skill base, uh, and as I say, connectivity. Uh, so I think, you know, we're really good, a really good place in terms of growth potential. And, you know, again, we talk it up, uh, any available opportunity as a place uh, for investment and a place that's uh, going places. Uh, having said that, we're not without our challenges. We have massive inequalities in our borough, some of the uh, wealthiest places to live in the north of England, but also uh, some of our neighbourhoods are in the top 10% uh, deprived areas of England as well. Uh, and that creates a real dynamic across our borough, uh, levelling up on a very micro uh, scale. Um, and our regeneration story really is about how do we uh, benefit uh, those more uh, disadvantaged areas and neighbourhoods and how do we make those connections. But um, just moving uh, on to the next slide. So we are focusing uh, majority of our regeneration in Stockport around the town centre. And we've been at this for about 10 years now, uh, very, very actively and in a very interventionist way. The other thing I'll say about Stockport Authority is we are a council of no overall control. Um, and uh, just to kind of bring that to life, we changed administration in um, May. Um, we had a Labour administration and then we have now got a Liberal Democrat administration. We've got all outs next year. I have absolutely no idea sat here now who is going to win that election. Um, and despite that uncertainty from a political point of view, we are cracking on and we've been like that for, for a decade. So it doesn't and it has not impacted on our regeneration delivery. Um, and one of the biggest reasons for that is that we have all our political groups locked into our regeneration ambitions. Uh, we work really hard at it. It is uh, pretty relentless, making sure that we go through every political group for all the big decisions and uh, some of the small ones as well that, that matter a lot to people, uh, but it is just part of the way that we work. So when we do have a change in administration, the new guys are, are locked in, and that's certainly been my experience in the last few months. And the red line you can see in front of you is the, the big kind of um, development, uh, place-based development scheme we've got at the moment, uh, which is the first mayoral development corporation in Greater Manchester, uh, first development corporation really focused on town centre uh, uh, living, town, town centre living. And this complements a lot of other work we've been doing around uh, transforming our town centre. Because the other challenge we have in Stockport is we've got no land to develop uh, that isn't green belt. Uh, so, uh, you know, we may be, I would say we're pretty good at a lot of things, but uh, we don't have a local plan and we find it really difficult to get green belt release uh, through our local politicians. Uh, as my colleagues and friends in Greater Manchester on this call today know, uh, Stockport exited the Greater Manchester Spatial Framework a year or so ago, uh, and that was due to the politics and the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the challenges with Greenbelt. The reason for saying that means that where we get consensus is that town centre living is where we want to focus the majority of our new housing in the borough. Not only is it redevelopments of sustainable brownfield land around transport interchanges, but it also, also is going to fuel the rest of the town centre investment that we've been working on over that last 10 years. So there's a kind of real coherent reason and rationale for why uh, put in um, majority of our new housing 
in this area, about three and a half thousand uh, new homes, soon to go up to about five and a half thousand uh, over the next few years. And the Development Corporation is a, is a new, it's, it's an entity. Uh, we got it through Devolved Powers. It's been supported and sponsored by Andy Burnham. And if you just move on, Amber, I think there's a, a couple of slides that just give a little bit more uh, detail on this. Uh, our chair is Lord Kerslake. Uh, we've got a private sector board and all our politicians are board members. Every single group in the council, now including the Green Party and our independents, sit round the table of our MDC and are very proud and have a complete single focus. When we went to UK Reef this year, we went en masse. All our political leaders came, sat in the audience and sponsored what we're doing here. Uh, again, it comes back to how do you bed that into uh, into the political landscape and, and not get off course with any changes. Uh, so just to bring to life what some of the schemes are, uh, if we just move through the next few slides, Amber, uh, we uh, developed a framework, uh, but it was quite high level, pretty ambitious around uh, a green uh, neighbourhood um, and uh, a new urban neighbourhood, which really sets the, the tone in terms of design. So what we... Um, also did is it you know my, my other kind of point is it's not good enough just to have a master plan as you will find out from Tom in a minute as well what we need to back that with as local government is delivery and in order to galvanize delivery you need money and you need cash so we set aside a hundred million pound investment facility out of the council's prudential borrowing capability to invest in the MDC we did that right at the beginning and that signals the call to the market that says we're in this we're serious and we're in it in the longer term. Just as a bit of background in terms of how much it costs us revenue wise, there's probably half to three quarters of a million pound of dedicated revenue goes into this every year, ring fenced in the council. So it's not something that you do on top of everybody's day job. We need to really seriously as local government, in my view, invest in capacity. Where you find those skills is another matter at the moment. Uh, we're looking at infrastructure and um, all the um, kind of core hard infrastructure, Stockport Station, uh, absolutely fundamental, but it's the softer infrastructure of schools, of doctor surgeries, of public realm, of walking and cycling schemes, the U, uh, EV charging points, etc., all in one place in that neighbourhood, over 130 acres. If you just move through, Amber. So we are a few, three years in, um, we've got about um, £450 million pounds worth of construction activity happening in Stockport at the moment, which is big for a town of our size, uh, not big for London or Manchester City area, um, but big for Stockport. You can see cranes uh, in their multitudes at the moment, if I look outside of my office window. So that's the scale of delivery that we're in. Um, and uh, we've got some big developers of RISE, um, Capital and Centric of, uh, are developing out um, a major scheme uh, called Weir Mill, which I'll uh, touch on in a moment. Um, and we have also bid for a new hospital to move our big Foundation Trust Hospital, Stepping Hill, out of the suburb into the town centre, um, which, uh, again, is another kind of a statement piece around the scale of the ambition for our town centre. Um, and I think that revenue and capital investment up front from local government um, has been absolutely fundamental. And the support of the combined authority. So, you know, Andrew's round the table, his colleagues, uh, Danielle is round the table and Homes England have been on the board of the MDC right from the start, galvanising commitment, understanding that that place based single focus approach is there to get delivery done. Uh, and that is evidence in so far, and it's not perfect uh, to, to be the case. We've, we've not only got this on site, we've got a pipeline of the next three to five years. And thereafter, there's a lifetime worth of work, as we all know. So just keep whipping through some of the projects now, just to bring it to life a bit. Um, so this is one of the first projects we did uh, outside the station. Um, it was um, basically a piece of land that the council bought, brought Muse in, financial crash, Muse couldn't finance it, council stepped in, Muse of Development managed it out. We're now in phase four. Every phase has been uh, filled. This is grade A office space in the middle of a, of a town centre. We are not competing with the city. We are proud town borough in our own right. We're seven miles away from Manchester City, uh, city Centre, 
Uh, it's like a tube stop at the station to get to Manchester. So we are so intricately linked with the success of the city, but we're not a competitor. Uh, we offer the same standard, but different location, uh, very reduced price in the city, and that suits some occupiers, not others. Uh, again, I'll whip through because I'm probably talking for too long. These are just some of the images of the next phase. Uh, the one on the left is a CGI. Um, yeah, those are, but the buildings behind are all built. Just keep going through, Amber. Uh, another project, this is funded through some funding from the um, Greater Manchester Combined Authority redevelopment of a mailbox. It is still, I think, the biggest green wall in the north of England. Uh, if it's not, I'll ask anybody else to prove it. Uh, that's my uh, uh, <laughs> kind of uh, mantra at the moment. But I think there is some schemes in the pipeline that are going to overtake that. But setting the sustainability targets, just keep going through. Um, the interchange, great example of working with the combined authority in transport for Greater Manchester. There's a £130 million scheme of transport money, housing money, Homes England money, uh, council, patient equity, combined authority, patient equity and some £30 million of private finance. This is on site at the moment. Uh, but Andrew and our Andrew Mack and I, who you've just heard from, have spent probably weeks of our lives in meetings getting this away. Um, we have been at this for about six, seven years and now it is coming to fruition. Uh, but again, it's a message of just what a hard slog these kind of schemes are. Uh, but it is going to be transformational, We're using transport money basically to deliver regeneration in a new two acre park in the heart of the town centre uh, that really is going to make a difference um, to the, you know, everybody's lives around the area. Uh, so just keep moving through. Um, council itself delivered directly a new um, uh, leisure scheme a few years ago. We've done all sorts. We work with news. We've got development partners. We've got SPVs. This we did directly uh, just um uh, and um, so every model of regen we have on the go at the moment, I probably wouldn't do something of this scale again ourselves directly. I think we'd bring in a development partner, um, but it's all let, it's working. It's absolutely fundamental now to the town's offer. We just keep moving through. Um, this is one where we brokered with a developer, uh, M&S were leaving the town. So we said, you can't just leave and sell it to anyone, sell it to us. We had a preemption agreement, but then we put a developer in front of us and they've now developed it out. And that's no longer a CGI, it's a reality. It looks amazing. Uh, again, in the heart of the town centre, it'll be another 400 jobs. Just keep moving through. Um, Stop room future high streets fund. So this is how we're aligning all the money that you can possibly get your hands on. Uh, into a multitude of schemes and I suppose the other message is you can't just work on one scheme can't just work on one sector it's got to be housing leisure culture retail all at the same time this is a new public uh, community uh, learning and discovery centre that we're doing uh, in the uh, shopping centre that we bought a number of years ago just keep moving through um, we're doing new big box retail uh, in the town centre. Again, nobody wanted the old tired BHS building, so we bought it and we're redeveloping it. Uh, we're just about making this work with a squeak, uh, but we're going to take some long term risk on this. But it's worth it because we've got some big occupiers about to announce. Again, if we move through, I won't spend too much time. It's not just the big physical stuff. We've got pop up shops showcasing uh, local producers. They are going a storm. We've got a waiting list till Christmas now for some of our pop up shops. Um, again, because we bought the shopping centre, we can actively manage it and put our tenants in ourselves. Again, keep moving through, Amber. I won't. Um, we've got Heritage Lottery funding to do our kind of cultural play. Some of the murals are just fantastic, really bringing this um, area to life. And it's the attention to detail that this kind of area, which you can see the culture coming out of the screen, um, but the we absolutely give attention to minute detail in this area around paving and shot, and it really does uh, make a difference in terms of quality and focus and other people are investing. Um, so keep going through, please. We're Mill, this is Capital and Centric coming on board. These are CGIs at the moment, but the scheme's on site. Um, Derelict Mill. Um, right on the edge of uh, the town centre. And keep going, please. Uh, Stop up college again, another aligned investment redeveloping. Keep going through. 
Um, and this is where we're working with others as well, uh, with the college and with um, Investar actually on this one for a major housing scheme. But I'll just, I'll, I'll whiz to the end now because I'll just to land some key messages. So some of the challenges, um, it just takes a lot of time, energy, and, um, you know, council always has to have a vision, has to have ambition, has to show leadership, but not to drown anybody else. And, you know, as I say, uh, Danielle, Andrew, all the politicians absolutely co-design, co-production of our plan. Um, social infrastructure really key. And it is really hard at the moment. Um, so um, inflation market pressures, everybody will be feeling it. We're taking a slightly longer term view. Uh, we're not doing everything. Um, we're, we're, we're really picking our projects at the moment and having great relationships with good contractors really matters. Um, having the relationships with contractors where you've got enough of a pipeline to pick up the phone and say, we need you to bid on this and getting that traction. Um, and if you don't find the right developers, don't work with them. Uh, absolutely take the time. So. I think um, in summary of this bit, if you just move on, please, Amber, sorry. Um, loads of lessons, loads along the way. Um, really drawing on diversity of experience and voices. Uh, but ultimately, council has to be prepared to roll your sleeves up, put money in, uh, take some risk, not get everything right. And we've certainly not got everything right. Uh, and having that confidence in politicians and politicians having confidence in the officer team uh, is absolutely vital. Where we are not as good is around that understanding and bringing in that voice of the local community. And we're doing a lot more work now to do that. And our new levelling up fund bid is, is just about that. Um, and we are learning that. So I'm, I'm keen to hear others' views uh, on that. Uh, and galvanising energy and part and commitment from partners um, is, you know, is, is something that I think local government needs to kind of take the lead on. Uh, so you, I think the other message is, you know, we never stand still. So we've got the next pipeline, eight acre site out for procurement uh, very shortly. We've done some soft market testing. We did a launch at UK Reef. That's another 1,200 homes uh, looking to increase our connectivity through Metrolink. Uh, you know, so big, big pipeline yet to come. So working on the vision, working on current and making sure we're not losing momentum and the future, uh, absolutely essential. But I'll leave it there. Um, and I think I'm handing over. Well, I know I'm handing over to uh, my colleague, Tom. Thanks, Caroline. Can everybody hear me OK? Hopefully. Shout if not. If we can move on to the first slide, uh, that'd be great. Um, uh, so I'm Tom Stannard. I'm Chief Executive at Salford City Council, and it's great to um, follow Andy and Caroline really on, on this whole um, topic of our growth story, our regeneration journey and what's coming next. And I think what's really um, positive about this, to be honest, is going after someone with as much enthusiasm and longevity for this as Caroline's had really. Um, she's definitely, I know, um, having worked in other parts of GM over the years myself, um, been around the block in getting Stockport and Stockport Town Centre in particular to where it is today. And I think what's a really great um, uh, facet of that links to what Andrew was saying about the whole um, family approach to this in Greater Manchester, the leadership and the drive and the kind of energy and ambition around that. And I think... Um, Caroline and many other colleagues in GM uh, really exemplify that, which is which is fantastic to see. So hopefully I can just add a bit to that in terms of our story here in Salford and what next. I think you um, <clears throat> hopefully know us reasonably well um, as a place. There are two cities in Greater Manchester, of course. I represent the first of those, and you may have heard of the other um, smaller and less significant second city, which is Manchester City Council. <laughs> Uh, moving on to the um, second slide, if we can, um, you can see from this our proximity to uh, Manchester City Centre itself is essentially where the circle is on the right hand side that says Salford City Centre. The boundary between ourselves and the middle of Manchester is um, uh, not very easy to recognise at all from a residential, a business growth and an inward investment point of view. And we do um, despite the kind of uh, trade-offs about the two cities, we do act and behave as one regional centre very much. And that's exemplified by the city centre growth story, 
and by the story of the transformation of uh, Salford Keys and Media City itself. And our story is one of transformation and growth, as you can see from this slide. We've had a, a clear, very, very long standing, ambitious economic vision. It stretches back well over 20 years in terms of the council taking very significant land and capital risk to gear all of that activity very much as part of the rebirth of the regional centre of Greater Manchester. And that's been backed by political leadership, um, political stability um, in Salford's case, and a very strong collaboration with the private sector in the delivery of that very large scale area based regeneration. I'm going to focus particularly on Salford Keys and on the Crescent in this, but not forgetting the city centre, the historic city centre of Salford, which has been a big part of that story. And any of you who have travelled um, up and down Chapel Street over recent years will see that um, for yourself as the gateway into what we're now doing um, at the Crescent. But we're definitely not a place or a city that stands still. And I think our development successes to date mean that we are now um, demonstrably not just one of GM's, but one of the Northwest's core drivers of investment and opportunity. And that regional centre of GM um, is much the stronger by all of the partnerships across the region that support that. So if we can move on a page, please, um, you will hopefully see a large eyeball there overseeing um, a historic uh, map of um, Salford City Centre. And I think this is really just to exemplify that we are um, in an ultra challenged position, despite some of those uh, excellent examples of regeneration and growth over the years. Still the 18th most deprived local authority nationally in the country. Across several parts of the city, um, deprivation is getting worse, not better. That includes um, wards in the middle of Salford, like Langworthy, um, Odsall, and places of that nature, as well as many of our outer lying town centres um, that are in very, very, very close geographic proximity to some of these um, higher end areas of growth that have um, really led the way in the northwest. And I think that challenge of the interrelated nature of high unemployment, high um, underemployment, low incomes, economic inequality, high levels of crime is part of the um, story of the next stage of regeneration that needs to take into account those inclusivity elements uh, in a big way. So we do not rest on our level, laurels uh, at all on that agenda. We can move on to the next slide, please. Um, here we just uh, illustrate really our successes um, in recent years and how we've tried to capitalise both on that recent growth and on the growth to come. Um, you can see the stats on the 20-year uh, population uh, forecast. We will be bigger than some of the smaller boroughs in central London um, uh, by, that, by that point in time. And in particular, if you look at the recent ONS mid-year population estimates, they show that Salford has registered close to 16% in population growth um, since the last census was undertaken, far outstripping virtually every other um, local authority area across the northwest of England and on a par with some of the highest density population growth areas of um, inner London. So that population and with it residential and business growth is literally booming in our area um, and that's a very big um, factor for us in the regeneration story. Putting on significant uh, further jobs by 2040 as well and significant investment and productivity as you can see um, from this slide. There is also good sectoral distinctiveness in Salford and digital creative and media, one of our leading sectors and going through its next stage of transformation really in um, innovation and the whole innovation Greater Manchester um, approach. The local health economy is also very significant and education um, also a very significant sector and we obviously host um, one of the big higher education institutions in Greater Manchester in the University of Salford um, as well. Um, on to the next slide. Um, this really gives a flavour of some of our strategic place-based growth locations um, and our approach has always been focused on that delivery of place-based programmes in driving growth and transformational change um, across the city. You can see these on the chart here. The city centre Salford which extends that whole Chapel Street regeneration corridor up to the Crescent and beyond. Um, and into our joint venture um, partnership with ECF around the redevelopment of Salford University. Salford Keys and Media City itself 
Um, Greater Manchester's Western Gateway, and this includes the Port Salford Freeport area, which is very much connected to the Liverpool City region and to the real benefits that will come from that custom site designation um, for Port Salford and our town centres as well. Significant urban centres with um, uh, retail decline challenges alongside population growth challenges and very much connected to work I've done myself in other parts of GM in the past and to some of those challenges out beyond Stockport itself that Caroline talked about. So the town centres approach is very much um, part of our future vision. And this is now very much about how we harness that future growth that I mentioned in terms of population booming that's coming, dovetailed with tackling our big, big challenges and particularly um, focusing on longer lasting links across the skills and work and employability agenda, which we're putting a lot more investment into um, in the year ahead. So if we can just move on to the next slide. Great. Thanks very much. And I uh, couldn't have put it better myself. It is a big, complicated, uh, uh, interlinked and very, very bold, ambitious project this. And uh, what you can see on the slide there is just a quick kind of visual overview of the extent of that um, Salford Crescent Master Plan. Um, just to the right of the uh, slide there where it says A6 Crescent Upgrade is the connectivity into Chapel Street, which is um, one of Salford's big success stories in recent years. But you can see uh, from that summary, this is a two and a half billion, uh, 240 acre scheme in total being delivered in partnership with the ECF, very much with Homes England um, part and parcel of that alongside ourselves and the University of Salford providing significant capital and land contributions uh, into that scheme and we know this will deliver over the medium term improved access to education significant enhancement of the regional resi offering and delivering world leading facilities very much connected to the innovation gm program i mentioned earlier around sectors including acoustics robotics orthotics um, prosthetics many other things that link into the health innovation economy as well as a big and important link to um, artificial intelligence and immersive tech, which is present both at the university and down at Media City. So happy to speak more about that in the Q&A. If we just whip on to the next slide, um, <clears throat> this is really just to um, preface a few things to uh, tell the story very, very briefly, uh, given the time on Salford Keys and Media City. And this is as I mentioned at the outset, really, um, the historic regeneration of the Keys and the waterfront um, is one of not just Salford, um, but GM and the North's um, great success stories in recent years. And a real privilege to have inherited um, much of that success story when I came to the council um, 18 months or so ago, and really to build on that in the next phase of development, which we can see um, on the next uh, slide. And it's quite interesting, really, that despite the fact that many of you will know um, the uh, Keys story and the Media City story well, um, it's only approximately a third complete. So the next phase of that journey down at the Keys, and particularly in the next phase of our relationship with Peel and their new investor partner, Landsec, who are also investing um, in Mayfield in Manchester City Centre, um, we are looking to accelerate the plans now to double the size of Media City um, through a further close to 700 million or so investment, creating many thousands of construction jobs, but particularly building on those successes you can see on the slide there with already um, over 10,000 people now employed um, within a range of roles in and connected to Media City and a, a very big, very prominent role to play in the Innovation GM programme to follow that. So. Media City um, is far from done, and I think the pathways into the innovation sector discussions, as well as what will be a fairly significant um, physical expansion of Media City, um, and you'll have seen some of that, any of you read the Regeneration Trade Press in terms of planning decisions we're making in the context of all of those next phase outline consents, um, we'll be able to see that coming through um, fairly swiftly. So um, on to my uh, final page, you can see uh, hopefully from uh, some of the things that I've said, some of the things I've covered and from my um, video assistance earlier in the talk, um, we are absolutely on a mission and this partnership cuts across public, private and the voluntary sector in delivering against not just the physical redevelopment and the growth ambition, but the inclusive growth ambitions 
And I think that is a very, very big and important part of the next phase of our story is really making connections and inroads through our skills and employment programs into delivering inclusive growth um, for real and seizing what will be massive opportunities to come um, from Salford's next major wave uh, of regeneration as part of the whole GM success story. But I would conclude just by saying we are very, very much um, part of a family in Salford and in Greater Manchester. And I think that echoes and resonates through hopefully some of the things that I've said where GM has been an essential partner in our success story, as it has in Stockport, as Caroline said. And um, Andy, I think, gave a great overview of how we work on that um, across the region as a whole. And I think that partnership and that stability um, is essential. It transcends political change, as a number of us have said, and it helps us to keep that stability and confidence really from the market and those key private investors who are very much with us on that journey. And critically, with very important partners, Danielle, like Homes England, who we look forward to working to um, further on this whole journey. Hope that's helpful and look forward to further discussion. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, Tom. I'll just try and come on camera again uh, so colleagues can see me. Uh, thank you. What an uplifting suite of presentations. I know it's only Thursday. But I've definitely got that Friday feeling after those ones. And I have the privilege of, of working alongside uh, Tom, Caroline and, and Andrew day to day. But sitting back and reflecting on it here in this forum, it really is impressive. And there's a whole suite of comments and commentary that we'll come to in the chat in just a second. Um, what I would like to say is that um, as Homes England and you would have heard through the presentations, uh, we're, we're plugging in to our local partners to support delivery on that place-based footprint, very much working with and guided by the forms and the functions of partnership working that are fit for purpose for the task in hand. So whether that be strategically uh, with the combined authority and looking at new vehicles at scale across functional economic footprints, whether that be within tight red line boundaries within the mayoral development corporation or thinking more broadly across the borough and the growth plans that you see here for Salford. And it's pleasing that there's examples within those case studies where the agency is already investing in sites like Weir Mill or funds with the likes of English Cities Fund. Uh, that is within the confines of our existing programmes at the moment. And I kicked off at the start of this session talking about the white paper and that reframing of this organisation to take on a broader regeneration mandate moving forwards. Uh, I'm sure we'll pick up some of the asks in the panel discussions of uh, how like, we might need to adapt in order to play a fuller part in that role. Uh, what I would say to participants on the call though is keep your eyes peeled for post-summer, uh, for the refresh of our strategic plan, uh, for further details on those previous spending review commitments, for more resources for brownfield land and infrastructure funding, and hopefully opportunities to not only expand but extend this partnering approach uh, across the country. I'll move across to the Q&A panel session now, if that's OK. I wonder if Caroline, Tom and Andrew can come back on camera for that. Um, if I start off with a point that was echoed through the Salford presentation about looking to our past, but also looking to the future. There were questions in the in the sidebar there, and I'll start with you, Tom, and then go across the panel, if I may, around uh, how are you ensuring that the developments that come forward are, are basically you know, accessible to existing communities, but also bringing in and adapting to perhaps the 21st century ideals that new communities might have in seeking to locate within your area. So, Tom, can I come to you first on that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a number of um, important strands to that, Daniel. One, one, and I'll keep it fairly high level, but I'm sure we can expand more if helpful. But I think one is about um, not just focusing on the high end, high value projects and balancing that with town centre interventions. So a lot of the work that I've not got enough time to talk about this afternoon that we're doing in Swinton, in Eccles and all the way out in um, town centres like Little Halton and Walkden, um, balances that off. I think the second issue is about focusing on true housing growth, affordability and housing need in and amongst those schemes. And our um, uh, social rent delivery vehicle, Derive, is a big part of that, which is actually doing, relatively speaking, less of the stock in the areas I talked about in my presentation and much more in those um, other town centres. 
um, and in areas like Oddsall in proximity to Media City, where we've got an opportunity to intervene to bring that residential growth about in the um, lower value, lower demand market areas. Um, and I think the final thing for me, Danielle, is as, as I've just actually stuck on to one of the questions in the chat is about focusing on the labour market and skills and employment interventions in parallel. I think what's key is not just doing the physical redevelopment, but focusing on labour market mobility. Some of that is about skills, qualifications, acquisition. Some of it is just about brokerage between communities and job opportunities and getting those um, escalator opportunities done. And we've done a lot through host in Media City, which used to be called The Landing, if people have heard of it, um, which is just one example of how we've got that kind of accelerator pathway for particularly deprived disadvantaged communities into the digital creative media production etc cetera, etc cetera, sectors so i think it's those three um broad brush areas for me thanks very much for that tom and caroline that um vibrancy of the town center but also a focus on inclusive growth is something very dear to the mayoral development corporation board do you say a bit more about that yeah and uh, i agree with everything tom's just said as a kind of overarching and I think just taking it right down, just, just to kind of complement what Tom said to a very practical thing that we uh, did is focus on unlocking a project that really matters to people locally. So if you're trying to do something and everybody will know that building that's been derelict for 15 years, in our, in our case in Stockport, you've already heard us talk about Weir Mill. The whole community knows about Weir Mill because it's an eyesore right on a junction the carriage it's been it's been derelict for 15 years it's had buddlier growing out of it for the last seven and people know those buildings so if i i think an evidence of really connecting to the place is if if we can really breathe new life in a in a really lovely way in a beautiful way which is going to happen with weir mill into an old historic um building that's not only got real heritage value and cultural value that's linked to the heart of the kind of you know the industrial revolution in the in the north and but also uh reinvent it and make it relevant then i think it it really shows to a community that we mean business i think somebody's put in the chat about gentrification i think that's always a risk around how do we really create that inclusive um regeneration that is for everybody um but I do think there are, and there will be, you know, and there has been all through my career, kind of those absolute signature projects that you know you've got to unlock to evidence change and and they are authentic to their own place and treat them, you know, so kindly and gently and really think about the future of those buildings because they mean an awful lot. But it also says an awful lot if you can't do them. And that that's a real, you know, I think that's really hard and it has taken, you know, ma many a decade really to get that one underway. So it's just to add really to what Tom said, because I think Tom's kind of given that that really good overarching view. Um, and I think there are things that we can all learn. So I would say we're a bit further behind on the whole inclusive growth than Salford and some of the work that you're doing. And I think the other parts of these kind of sessions, the value of it and the value of that family in Greater Manchester that we've talked about is actually you can kind of you can learn a lot and you can kind of just, you know, you don't have to have all the ideas yourself. Absolutely. I think we're all learning, even us on the panel here today, joint sessions. I mean, Andrew, one of the points that was raised in the sidebar there was around, you know, do specific targets exist alongside these grand spatial plans and priority areas? Do you have targets for particular types of housing, delivery, affordable housing, specialist accommodation, that sort of thing? Uh, you know, do you want to offer a view on that at a GM level? Yeah, no, I think through the housing strategy, there are there are targets and aspirations we're trying to meet, but I think actually the way that we operate across the city and local authorities is that you you have to take scheme on a scheme by scheme basis. You adapt and flex the investment and funding that you've got to enable the delivery of the key projects that, that local authorities are trying to deliver. So I know Caroline mentioned, you know, we are mill there, but there's the, the other uh, the other picture that she flashed up earlier with the massive green wall was the old Stockport sorting office and you know we funded that through the investment fund took a more flexible approach that was a probably more of an ISO that wanted rid of rather 
you know, a heritage asset that wanted to be celebrated. Equally, these are all existing assets, and then you walk down the street and you're into the Stockport Interchange, which is, you know, delivered a, a you know, Stockport Interchange and residential block into which, you know, the CA invests to the transport side and in the housing side, and you've got a new, you know, green open space there, which which creates the, I think, the community space that people are starting to look for and, and the way that everyone's now living and working post the sort of COVID pandemic. So I think. I mean, maybe as I said earlier, you know, these guys do more of the hard work in terms of the vision and I try and adapt and flex the money that we've got to support the delivery of their ambitions. You know, Brownfield Housing Funds actually being, uh, you know, more grant towards net zero and social homes so that we do provide that better mix of, uh, of, of housing. But again, it's all it's all driven by the local authority priority schemes that they are bringing forward and us trying to trying to adapt to be able to fund those uh, and, and deliver those place-based uh, place based schemes that, that they want to deliver. And I think we're seeing that when uh, we're having conversations with yourself around the types of homes that we're seeking to deliver across those growth locations. We're not divorcing these things into separate work streams. It's considering the place as a whole, its makeup. Uh, and, and people within the context of that. I wonder if I can merge two questions together, which I suppose are in the theme of uh, catalyst and turning point. Uh, Tom, you picked this one up in the chat in terms of, you know, a small rundown town centre. There'll be colleagues online who are facing uh, those challenges at the moment. Perhaps they've got uh, pockets of levelling up funding or towns fund to do some things. But there's a query really about, is there a particular catalyst that, that kickstarts things? And what's that tip point that brings private sector investment behind? Yeah, I mean, I, I think if I can just be completely frank, Danielle, and, and hopefully speaking amongst 350 friends or however many people there are here, um, it is not the drip drip of um, this week's latest levelling up pot or, or anything of that nature. For me, it goes back to um, you know, I think Caroline spoke really well about the, um, you know, some people perceive political change to be an obstacle to this, but actually transcending that with a place based vision that is shared amongst local political leaders is really important. And to some extent, that's been the story in self of what's given um, a lot of the private sector confidence here has been <clears throat> stability in vision between all of the key stakeholders in the area, the political leadership, the private sector, the investor community and others. And I think it's really about saying, you know, you can grip some very, very, what, what appear to be intractable town centre challenges or derelict Dockland type challenges. And we all know the story that 25 years ago, within quite recent memory, people were saying there's no way in hell that that could happen at Salford Keys. Look at the state of the place. There's still kind of stacks of crap all over the all over the joint and uh, you know and we got there and we did it and i think you know the 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 key with town center regeneration with some of those you know even small scale difficult sites all the way through to very intractable retail blight type problems is clarity of vision clarity of leadership and ability to stay the course with partners it requires that from national government and particularly brokered i think through the help that agencies like HE can bring to the table, Danielle, which is massively helpful to the mix in this. And I think that's really key is it's that sense of, you know, what investors like least is instability and, and, and uncertainty. And I think what we can bring as, you know, um, conductors of those partnerships is exactly that level of confidence, really. We could speak, I'm sure lots of us, particularly Andy, uh, for hours about the the problems of the kind of micro bidding culture and trying to knit all that together. But for me, that's a you know, that's a delivery contribution is not the thing to focus on in this. That longer term approach to delivery. I mean, Caroline, you said that was so critical in terms of building private sector confidence and you're able to progress your SRF in not shy of 12 months, which is impressive. The pace of delivery of activity that's been going on around the MDC area. Uh, you chose to launch the MDC uh, out at Mippin on an international stage and the eight acre site at UK Reef. Uh, you trailed it just a couple of weeks ago. How important has that been in terms of signalling Stockport's open for business and the seriousness with which you are approaching town centre regeneration? Yeah, I think it's. Um, I think it did have a big impact actually a few years ago at 
Uh, Mippy and I think UK Reef was an excellent um, event. We really got a lot out of it this year. Um, uh, just being able to create a real focal point and a conversation around a place. Um, I think it's really important to have a clear message and it's not, I think there's a timing thing for it. So uh, having, an app, having a product or having something to launch, not just to launch a plan, um, and I think the uh, so the launch in the MDC was saying that we've invested 100 million. Come and talk to us. So that was the hook. It wasn't just we've launched the MDC or we've launched a master plan. The launch at UK Reef now is we've assembled an eight acre site. We've been doing it behind the scenes for years. We've now got this. Come and talk to us. We're ready. We're ready to put this site to market. So I think the big lesson I've kind of learned and you know fortunately it's a positive one and there's many lessons <laughs> along the way and in my career where it's not so positive but on this one it has where actually think about the having a product not just an idea or a or a glossy set of CGIs you've got to be able to back it up with money site and the but and be able to see a very clear plan for delivery and I think just linked to that being quite assertive about once you've got those things in place, you can be assertive with the market to an extent. Mm -hmm. um, and it just puts you in a more confident position. Thanks very much for that, Caroline. Uh, there's a couple of more challenging questions in the chat, which I'm not going to ignore. I've saved them especially for you, Andrew, but colleagues interested in you know, the practicalities of uh, planning, particularly when you're coordinating and collaborating across boundaries and where there may be uh, political change as part of the, of the journey. You know, how are you managing that in reality? I think, you know, from a broader from a broader sort of spatial focus, everyone's bought into it. I know Carly mentioned the, uh, you know, the, the stock folk position, but I think what's actually key to focus on there is that yes, you know, stock folk aren't actually within the spatial framework that's now going forward, but actually the way in which we address everything else and the, the growth across the conurbation very much has stock folk as one of the 10 partners is almost irrelevant if they're not actually in the spatial framework. So how do we manage that? It's through that governance structure, the fact that there is the open forum for the discussion between the leaders, the chief execs, directors of place that mean that you get and can across what we're doing at the various levels and that enables difficult discussions. I mean, I, I think my my personal view is you can't, you can't undermine and, and uh, not respect how important personal relationships are because you get a trust that you build in the work that you do. So actually uh, through those relationships, you, you actually build trust across the system and, and with difficult challenges, don't get me wrong, you know, sites in and out of the, the spatial plan. But ultimately, when everyone had agreed the ultimate overarching objectives, everyone knew they needed to get to a final position. So yes, there was a bit of, you know, I want this in and out, but ultimately everyone already agreed, you know, the framework within which we need to get to an answer. And because you have those relationships, we all we all get there uh, over over time. So that, I mean, they're, they're sort of critical. And I, and I think coming back to sort of the Tom's comments, I think, you know, how do you, you know, what's the tipping point? How do you kickstart it? Things like having that longer term strategy and particularly around things that transport connectivity that enable the market to have confidence that there's going to be the you know, ability for people that are going to live in the new homes to access jobs in other parts of the conurbation and city centre. You know, they're, they're the, the building blocks upon which you get to the tipping point. I think for various reasons, the actual tipping point will be different in different areas and will continue to stitch together those different funding pots to build on the investment. But it's within that sort of longer term strategic context that you know, you know, what your next steps are in a location and that you can start to sort of build that investment on. You've demonstrated it in Media City, you know, we've done it in uh, doing it in Stockport Town Centre, Manchester City Centre, Salford Present. You know, there's various examples. So while we talk about the future, this is, you know, we've been doing this for 15, you know, 15 years. So it's just an extension of the historic approach uh, 
So yeah, I know that's not directly answering how do you particularly manage it because it depends on the situation. But I think for me, that relationship and the way the governance works is sort of fundamental to us actually getting the agreements that we do that we do get. Yeah, and those relationships and that maturity in your partnership work and the time to go through and formulate those plans, I think you can see it playing dividends, particularly in the cross-border collaboration that is taking place. Locally, we're seeing, um, you know, real evidence of, of that here back at Homes England. There's quite a lot of other questions and we are very short on time. So I'm going to fire a couple at you if that's OK. Um, one of the comments in the in the bar is really around you know, the importance of holistic regeneration. We're obviously focusing here on property led physical regeneration because they're the elements that we collaborate most upon. I think your your videos actually brought that to life around the breadth of the offer there and um, but sort of uh, how how important is it to have that more complementary view uh, of the holistic ingredients for regeneration tom come to you first on that one uh well the short answer is essential i think it goes back to what i said about the um employment employability um side of things daniel and in, in particular i think we certainly feel across gm that we have um <clears throat> probably neglected that issue too much in recent years that's a kind of collective view and we've we've kind of taken that view and set out our stall accordingly it's been a big part consequently of our devolution deals um and so on around the influence over the skill system but i think actually um there is a lot of um replacement capacity in that whole area that local government has got to take a leadership um uh role over because it it isn't coming back nationally I think we're reaching the view that we've been um, fussing for too long over adjudication of pots of money that used to be held nationally that are now held locally. The problem being they haven't actually got any bigger. They've actually shrunk over that period of time. And, you know, building that infrastructure to connect people to qualifications, acquisition opportunities and to connect them to practical opportunities in the world of work is key but that is expensive revenue heavy work and i think local government has to take more of an interventionist leadership role in that space alongside the um capital uh, expenditure and capital risk that we take on these programs thanks very much tom quick fire question to you caroline you've got some schemes on site at the moment the bus station we and mill you talked about the importance of getting those schemes out of the ground that visible uh, signal of change but are you concerned with the current economic downturn that there's going to be a pause to some of that live regeneration activity in flight now uh, and, and what are you doing around that um so it's mixed um there, there has been some stuff that's paused uh there's uh everything's wobbled um and we've managed to keep uh most of it on track but yeah some of it has paused because it's just you know it's just not the right time uh given the conditions um in, i think a lot of the schemes that are on site now squeaked through either we had contractors lined up ready to go or they were already in contract so i think we 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 got under the bar slightly on some of the activity um but it, it is an absolute constant struggle at the moment um and i haven't got any solution in it other than anybody else has other than you keep going uh, I think what we have, uh, so what we're doing as an authority around construction inflation is, uh, you know, to what extent can we take a slightly longer term view? Uh, to what extent are values changing? Uh, and to what extent do we just say not now for some things? Uh, so it's not not ever, but not now. Um, and then I go back to that point about finding really good contractors. Um, and if you've got if you've got relationships and you've got enough of a pipeline, then it's it's a contractor market. So uh, that, but that that's tricky and it's not always possible. Yeah, thank you very much. For that. I mean, we're certainly having echoes of that back here within Homes England and the partners are being very open, sharing their forward development pipelines with us uh, and illustrating where those sorts of more challenging viability issues are now landing, particularly in advance of that 1.5 billion that I referenced earlier on the call uh, that was uh, announced in previous spending reviews, but uh, you know set to come over the fence uh, in the autumn, really. Uh, if there are colleagues online who are struggling with viability, we just encourage an early conversation around that either in terms of new resources that may come across to Homes England or potentially flexibility uh, within existing programmes where that's a, where that's appropriate. Andrew, can I finish with you on the quick fire uh, question? Um, really in terms of, uh, I'll take one of each if that's okay, the sort of um, biggest barrier 
to delivery that you see at the moment sitting in the combined authority and perhaps the biggest opportunity on the horizon i'm conscious you've got your trailblazer devolution conversations kicking off tomorrow i won't pressure test you to reveal uh, too much of the detail but you know the biggest barrier and perhaps the biggest opportunity on the horizon is as you perceive it and then i'll do a quick sum up and pass to vic uh, i mean from my point of view probably the revenue capacity side is one of the biggest barriers because it, it, it is just difficult to get schemes worked up and I mean the, the construction cost challenge that's been referenced actually a lot of the answer to that is value engineering that needs more capacity to do that so it's a bit of a vicious circle uh, from that point of view uh, but I'm sure that Tom and Caroline probably might have other views on on their biggest barriers and I mean biggest opportunity yeah if the government's stable they follow through in the on the level white paper then yes the devil trailblazer will hopefully be one of the biggest opportunities that we've got i think uh i think they it would be more of an opportunity if there was some more money attached to it but from we're told there is no more money so this is within the realms of what, what's already on the table but actually provides a really good opportunity to address some of the challenges that i think have been referenced through the various responses to questions and presentations uh, today so yeah yeah tomorrow first discussion we'll see how it goes Good luck, best foot forward on that one. And yeah, I think the white paper is really clear. It's to make effective use of the existing resources that are available yeah. and announced. And I think you said at this kickoff at the session, uh, you know, public sector investment pump prime and that risk taking has a really important part to play. But the private sector and other partners do need to bring and be able to bring their capital around platforms for investment if we're to unlock regeneration at the scale. Uh, that we are looking for, particularly uh, in this part of the country. So thank you very much for that. Um, I must admit there's a there's a whole wealth of information through the course of the discussion today and the presentations. That's the beauty of place-based approaches to deliveries, that they're tailored, aren't they, to the to the local requirements. But there were a few key themes coming out which I spotted. Uh, you know, the importance of that clear vision and then taking that long-term view, the energy and drive you hear on the phone from uh, on the line uh, from yourselves and that was really clear to me and then starting with that deep dive and understanding of where your place-based opportunities are those growth locations where to focus uh, having a plan having solutions but having a product caroline you said not just announcing another thing another ambition having a product to sit alongside it uh, absolutely there's been a focus on this call around physical regeneration opportunities as catalytic opportunities but true regeneration and place-based work and extends far more holistically whether about the engagement with the university access to jobs employment uh, shops leisure it has to be part of that bigger picture uh, but a really clear theme what the importance of this being locally led and bottom up and for agencies and organizations to anchor in uh, around that. The upfront de-risking came through really strongly. You can't start off with a pick and mix approach to place-based delivery. There has to be that longer term logical sequence of events and your master planning land acquisition, the heavy listing and risk taking that I think we've seen in, in Stockport and in Salford. Uh, and that there's capital out there. You referenced DCF, you mentioned Peel and Landsec, but we know that there are investors there ready to play ball, but perhaps we need to do a little bit more in creating those platforms for the private sector to be attracted to. Uh, I really like the idea of three, five year, uh, 10 year signals for success. What does it look like? But not let's not be tied to the plan we start out with in day one. Political cycles will change, the market will change, but I think maintaining that long-term vision as we progress and being flexible and agile as we go uh, is really what we've seen across Greater Manchester, back from the 1980s and what we've seen in Salford over the past 20, 25 years, Tom, and that we continue to see there. And in terms of partnership working, form follows function. Let's not start off in a place of, I want a partnership that looks like X, Let's write the right type of partnership and way of working around the opportunity that is presented to us. And hopefully for colleagues on the call, you have seen examples of that uh, at the strategic level at the combined authority uh, and with Tom and Caroline uh, focused on their development of their growth ambitions and the mayoral development corporation. So thank you very much for joining us today for all the comments and questions there. I didn't get a chance to answer all of them, uh, but we'll stick around and reply to some of them in the chat bar there as well. And Vic, I'll pass back to you if that's okay. Wonderful. We go to the next slide. 
So it's just for me to say thank you again to our brilliant speakers and um, thank you for you for attending. If you have any further questions that haven't been addressed, please send us an email. There's the email address there. If you also know, need to know who you should speak to within Homes England as your relationship manager for a particular local authority, email us and we'll put you in touch. Thank you so much and have a great afternoon. Goodbye.